Welcome back everyone, I'm Professor Rhett Smith for ProtonGuru.com. Today we're going to be looking at organometallics and metal hydrides in Lesson 5.1. In the functional groups we've studied previously, like alcohols, ethers, and alkyl halides, carbon atoms are generally attacked by nucleophiles. We only really know a couple examples in which the carbon actually has the negative charge on it, where the carbon atom is the atom that acts as the nucleophile. These examples are the cyanide anion, where you can do an SN2 reaction, and you'd expect inversion of stereochemistry in that case. And then we know that you can take a strong base like this, deprotonate a terminal alkyne to generate an acetylide anion. That acetylide anion can then react with 1-bromobutane, again by an SN2 type pathway to push off the bromine, and that is a way to make a new carbon-carbon bond. Now we're going to talk about a couple other carbon-centered nucleophiles we can use in these types of reactions. We're going to talk about what are called organometallic species. These are compounds that have a carbon-metal bond. If you think about a cyanide, it would usually be associated with some sort of metal counter cation in some sort of salt. And acetylide would certainly also be associated with the sodium if you were to isolate the solid. We're going to talk about other specialized, specific types of organometallic species that are really good sources of nucleophilic carbon. And in order to do this properly, we should really preface our discussion by figuring out how we could make these compounds. One way you can make these compounds is through a process called oxidative addition. We haven't seen this type of step before, but it's usually a reaction where you take something like an alkyl halide and react it with a metal. The metal may have some charge on it already, or the metal might be neutral. And when you add the R group and the X group to the metal, remember that a carbon like in the R group, or a halogen like this X group, are both much more electronegative than the metal. So when you attach a metal to a nonmetal, you tend to think of that as an ionic bond, where if these were to break off, they'd break off as anions, and that means the metal has to have plus two charge to accommodate that. The net result is that you insert the metal between the R and X, so you break that bond and just stick the metal right in the middle. Remember, an increasing charge is called an oxidation, and of course we're adding two things to the metal. That's why this is called oxidative addition. Now, the opposite of that process, if two groups were to come off of a metal center and bind to each other, releasing the metal back, well, it's kind of the exact opposite of oxidative addition. Two things come off the metal, and the metal's charge decreases by two. So eliminate two things from the metal, and the metal's charge goes down by two. And I want to introduce this term here, ligands, People often use the word ligand to refer to something attached to a metal. So over here I could say this metal has two R groups as ligands. Now these groups attached to metals can also sort of trade which metal they're attached to in a process called transmetallation. In transmetallation steps you have an X ligand on one metal and an R ligand on the other metal at the beginning of the reaction. And in the end you see the R ligand has switched to M and the X ligand has switched to this M prime. You can also have scrambling of ligands in a process called ligand exchange, where you see that the metal starts with an R ligand and an X ligand, but over here the metal has two X ligands. Of course, those other two R ligands have to go somewhere, and there's another metal that was associated with these, and what happens to those will differ in different cases. The point is, if I have R-type ligands and X-type ligands on a metal, I can have some type of scrambling where I can rearrange how those are attached. Some things may break off and attach to each other, but this is called a ligand exchange process. So the net result is the metal scrambles its own ligands. It doesn't need a separate metal complex to react with it. All right, so that's how it differs from transmetallation. Well, I've mentioned how we can get a minus charge on a carbon by having the carbon attached to a metal. There are also cases where we might want to have an H minus nucleophile, and an H minus is called a hydride. And the H, in order to become nucleophilic, has to have a partial minus charge or a full minus charge depending on what compound you find it in. Now you can have really simple hydrides like sodium hydride, and if you saw that you'd say, okay, I have a metal nonmetal bond, I would expect the sodium to dissociate from the H to make sodium and hydride. That's true. That's a good complex that we'll see a little bit in this course. The other three that are a little more complicated that I want to talk about here are shown here. Let's start with the sodium boro hydride. If we draw out the Lewis dot structure for sodium borohydride after the sodium dissociate, it would look like this. Now the lithium aluminum hydride, just skipping the middle for a moment, will look very, very similar to the sodium borohydride. 
Instead of a sodium, it has a lithium floating around over here. But aluminum is in the same column of the PRC table as boron. So if we think about what the Lewis dot structure would look like for this, we'd see a very similar structure. It's this dibal H, which has this condensed formula. It's a little bit different from those two. And its structure would look like this if we drew it out in a line bond type of format. Let's think about these and evaluate their reactivity. I've indicated that lithium aluminum hydride is the most reactive. If you think about the polarity of these bonds, the aluminum hydrogen bond is much more polar than a boron hydrogen bond. Now this structure has a negative charge on it, which makes it a little more reactive than if we had a neutral boron species, certainly. But the aluminum-based hydrides are still a little more reactive. And the lithium aluminum hydride has both the aluminum hydrogen bond, which is pretty polar, and it has the negative charge on it. So that makes it more reactive than the neutral dibal H. So we have the potential to use a simple salt like sodium hydride or one of these three other salts to provide negatively polarized or anionic hydride nucleophiles for reactions. In future lessons, we'll look more into the specific types of organometallic reagents we can use and the reactions in which they're especially useful.